Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the organizing committee for the kind invitation. Very delighted to be in Bahrain today. Thank you so much. So um, we're, we're still being in the diabetes field, but we're going to talk about different molecules. We're talking about cholesterol, if you don't mind here, okay? So, uh, so we'll talk about cholesterol and see how we manage these uh, condition in patients with diabetic dyslipidemia. This is my disclosures. So we definitely understand there's multiple factors for, to contribute to the development of coronary heart disease, which is a leading cause for death in the Middle East and also in the GCC countries. And colleagues from this morning have been talking about diabetes as is one of the important factors to develop coronary heart disease. But also we have to keep in mind that lipids uh, plays a very huge role in development of atherosclerosis and then development of coronary heart disease. And definitely there's the non-modifiable risk factors that are related to age, gender, and family history that we can't really do much about, but we definitely can do much better in terms of risk factors modifications. And uh, looking for um, a single specific risk factor for the development of, for this instance, the first myocardial infarction, this is from the inherent study, looking at multiple risk factors in development of uh, ischemic heart disease, uh, diabetes plays a role, but lipids as a single risk factor plays even more than double the role of development of atherosclerosis. That's how important lipid management is, especially when you're treating and treating diabetic population. In the Gulf, uh, cardiovascular disease is the most common cause of death, accounting for about 45% of all mortalities. Um, the increasing prevalence of obesity is the direct cause for the development of type 2 and also diabetes and also uh, dyslipidemia. And uh, patients that present with heart attacks in the Middle East are 10 years to 12 years younger than those in Western countries. Um, dyslipidemia is still the main risk factor for the development of cardiovascular disease and we have to appreciate that and manage it aggressively. So an important factor when we're talking about therapies is to understand how these therapies actually works and what's the basics of changes in lipid profiles in patients when we actually even look at lipid profiles in diabetic patients. So we have to understand that these lipids um, carried in these specific vehicles, which we call them lipoproteins. And lipoproteins come in different classes, and each class has a different activity level to develop atherosclerosis. Uh, if you want to divide these lipoproteins to two Two major components, you can say that there's a ABOB lipoproteins and there's the AB, um, A1 lipoproteins. The ABOB lipoproteins are the ones that are uh, potentially pro-inflammatory. That is the one actually who direct, uh, direct, cause direct effect on atherosclerosis. And that's what we usually call well, when we're doing regular measurements of cholesterol, the non-HDL cholesterol. These uh, ABOB lipoproteins come in two isoforms, either ABOB48 and ABOB100. Uh, this depends on lipoproteins that they actually actually uh, originate from and where do they actually perform. Uh, Calomicrons, VLDLs, uh, these ones usually have a lot of triglyceride-rich particles, which either originate from the GI tract or from the liver. It depends on where they carry these triglycerides. Calomicrons usually the driving force for triglycerides from the gut towards the liver. VLDL is from the liver to the circulation, where they exchange lipids with HDL and, and forming LDL, which is another important marker for pro-inflammatory lipoproteins. Um, able A1 lipoproteins are basically what we call HDL, and usually there's the, uh, the anti-inflammatory effect. Even though measurement of cholesterol in the HDL it has not so far shown to be clinically significant in linking it to, uh, um, to therapeutic choices, uh, but at least understanding the basic of this, it makes it important uh, field to, uh, in, the, in, the, in the lipid management. Um, when do patients have a high levels of LDL, we definitely understand that the risk of cardiovascular disease increases. But if you have a patient with a higher LDL, and you can see the graph, um, the LDL um, levels in milligrams, as you go up on the levels of LDL, the risk of cardiovascular increases. This lines represents specific risk related to the patient profile. So you have at the bottom patients with no diabetes and no cardiovascular disease. And when you add these risk factors, the risk of developing cardiovascular disease significantly increases. If you see at the top, these are patients with chronic heart disease and diabetes. I'm sure you have a lot of population with these in your clinics. And these patients have the highest risk of developing cardiovascular disease. So this, this, they, uh, the role of therapies when they manage, uh, when we use them to manage lipid disorders, they come in three different uh, ways, or several different ways. So the mainstay for, for lipid treatments is, is usually statins, and statins reduce cholesterol synthesis by acting on certain enzymes, 
And when you reduce cholesterol synthesis, you deplete the cholesterol pool. And the one way of the, side, the hepatocytes try to improve this cholesterol pool is builds more LDL receptors. And building more LDL receptors at the surface of the hepatocytes gets clears out a lot of LDL from the circulation. And that's how statins lower um, LDL. Now, another um, a component of, of maintaining or improving this LDL level comes from different other uh, molecules or uh, therapies. Uh, for example, azitamibe, which usually works in the gut, is, is a drug that actually doesn't really work in the systemic circulation, but works in the GI tract, which blocks reabsorption of cholesterol that comes in the bile back to the liver. That also can deplete the cholesterol pool in the liver, and that makes upregulation of LDL receptors and then lowering LDL. PCSK9 inhibitors, we've been using them for several years. They maintain the LDL receptors. They, they, they stop the degradation of these receptors, make them much more available at the surface of the hepatocyte, and then lowering LDL receptor based on that. So these therapies combined, especially when we talk about the mainstay of statins, they've helped a lot reducing LDL. And when we reduced LDL achieved, um, we can definitely reduce coronary heart disease. These are a slide from uh, different um, uh, landmark trials related to statin use with combination therapies even to lower LDL levels, whether it's a primary prevention trial or a secondary prevention, primary in blue and secondary in, in red, targeting much lower LDL. And with a much lower LDL, um, we can achieve a much uh, reduction in coronary heart disease. So uh, we understand the basics of that statins can reduce LDL and then get better uh, improvement of cardiovascular disease. Does it work the same if we have a patient with diabetes, considering that we know that with diabetes, there is a considerable also uh, increased risk of cardiovascular disease? So the first initial thought comes from the HBS trial, which was published back in 2002. We randomized a huge number of patients with a coronary artery disease. About 30% uh, of them were had diabetes. And these patients, they were either given simvastatins or placebo. That time, you can't give placebo for diabetic patients. So at that time, they, they gave patients all simvastatin 40 milligram versus placebo. They followed them for about 55 years. So with simvastatins, cardiovascular disease events reduced by 33% in the diabetic subjects uh, without cardiovascular disease. Now, that was a primary prevention. That was the first signal that uh, LDR uh, reduction with statins in diabetes could be very helpful. And also reduced to 18% in those with pre-existing cardiovascular disease, showing that even those patients with considerable cardiovascular disease being diabetic, that also helped them reducing further risk. And um, what's interesting in the, scale, in the table you see on the left side is that regardless of what's the baseline LDL, um, uh, statins, when they reduced uh, their LDL, they sick, there was a comparable reduction in the cardiovascular events. And even if the baseline LDL was less than 2.6, that's also showing a significant reduction. And this is always the debate between us and patients. I'm sure I had this patient who points out that LDL that is actually a 2 or a 2.5 and doesn't want to take statins because it's actually good. And then um, the evidence is very clear that it actually can be very helpful. The first trial that actually was dedicated to diabetic patients uh, looking for events uh, reduction with statin was from the CARDS trial, which was a primary prevention trial, 2,800 patient diabetic patients who had no evidence of cardiovascular disease, but at least had one risk factors plus being a diabetic, and their LDL was less than 4.1. They gave them either a turvastatin 10 milligram or even a placebo at that point, and they followed them for about four years. There was a 37% reduction in the primary endpoint, which is major cardiovascular events. The TNT trial was the first trial that was done on diabetic population as a secondary prevention trial. It was much smaller, 1,500 patients with a coronary heart disease, and, and their LDL was less than 3.4 when they entered the trial. They, because they're secondary prevention, the trial wasn't able to do a placebo versus a statin. So they used a, a lower intensity statin versus a high intensity statin, directing LDL to be much lower. So a turvastatin 10 versus 80, uh, this is followed by 4.9, and reduction of the cardiovascular events happened in these population, about 25%. Hence, uh, cardiologists always, when they see a patient coming in the CCU with uh, acute MI being diabetic, they hit him with a, a, um, a turvastatin A milligram because of the TNT trial. Uh, so we, then we uh, 
with knowing the, all this information about uh, lipid lowering, we can appreciate that one millimole reduction of LDL can significantly reduce uh, cardiovascular events, whether these patients, diabetic patients, whether these patients had a vascular events or without vascular events. If you see the first subgroup, which were diabetes with vascular events, the subtotal reduction and the relative risk is about 0.8. That's 20% reduction with one millimole LDL lowering. And in patients without vascular events, a reduction of about 0.73. So that gives them about 27% reduction with one millimole of LDL. Um, so knowing that these therapies could work, which is based uh, uh, mainly a statin therapy, we still have a lot of population, unfortunately, not controlled. This is from the DICES-2 trial, which was done in Europe, looking at patients treated on statins or drug therapies for lipids, seeing if they actually can get into the right control uh, by the use of a statin therapy. And these are um, based on LDL lowering or LDL targets that was actually uh, not just as strict as what we do right now, but they are a little bit looser uh, back when this trial was actually conducted. Um, from, you, you can, from the lines you can see in colors, uh, yellow is the very high risk individuals, and you can see how much scary it is as only 26% were controlled LDL levels at that point compared to a much number of patients, but 81% um, uh, with the low risk actually getting control. Um, also to understand, because the, the, uh, the, uh, the very high risk individuals, their level of target of lowering LDL is much lower, which is less than 1.8. So it's not easy to get them into the right level with only a single therapy. This is for data from the, um, from the Gulf. Uh, this was published in 2014, the uh, CFIS trial, looking also similarly to the uh, uh, population using statin therapies, trying to lower the LDL within target. And also, the target here was an old uh, levels of LDL lowering based on the NCETB, uh, the uh, updated third version was back in 2004, and but much looser LDL levels at that time. As an overall group, only 52% were reaching LDL goal. If you look at secondary prevention, only 33% were reaching the goal of LDL based on uh, these guidelines. So lipid lowering therapy um, efficacy, if we combine them with other therapies other than statin, maybe we can be helpful to lower uh, LDL levels and then lower the cardiovascular disease. So statin efficacy, variable based on the drug itself, on the molecule being used. In blue, this is the 10 milligram of each of the three uh, statins that most widely used in the Gulf countries, so atrivastatin, ruzovastatin, and simvastatin. So a 10 milligram can lower LDL in different ways. Uh, atrivastatin about 37%, ruzovastatin higher potency, so 46%, and simvastatin much lower at 28%. Um, then you find in other colors, which is doubling the dose to 20, then 30, then 40 milligram. And you can see how much lowering of LDL you can achieve beyond the starting dose of a 10 milligram, which is very minimal. So for example, if you do simvastatin, 28% uh, percent reduction with a 10 milligram. If you keep doubling, reaching to 40 milligrams, you're only getting 18% extra on top of the 28, which is almost about 50% at that point. It was a little bit less than that. So um, doubling of statins doesn't get you a lot of levels of reduction, about 5 to 6% every time you do doubling from 10 to 20 or 20 to 40. So that keeps it um, um, a little bit restricted in terms of how much um, LDL that you need to achieve uh, in patients with much higher levels of LDL and definitely higher risk for cardiovascular disease. So the role of combination therapy uh, comes along, and we haven't what been using so far is azitamibe and PCK enzyme inhibitors, and something else also in the future probably we'll see much more of. So uh, azitamibe, when you add it to a statin, you can actually get a much lowering effect of LDL. This is an example of a, st a study where done on patients using statins. And if you add azitamide versus placebo on LDL, you'll see about 25% reduction further down um, on additional therapy and, and addition of azitamide. Uh, triglyceride also, you can have a slightly lowering effect because these, I remember, if you remember these lipoproteins, some of them actually have triglyceride when they are formed. So when you reduce it, uh, the, um, the, you can also reduce it a little bit of extra triglyceride. So about 14% reduction. Um, and this is very interesting is that when you join azitamibe with a statin therapy, you can save the patient using very high doses of a statin. So this is an example here of doing a turvastatin 10 milligram, 
plus ezetimibe 10 milligram, reaching an um, LDL reduction of about almost 50%, which is equivalent to what, what an 80 milligram of atorvastatin can achieve for you. So this is, gives you an idea is that maybe you can use this, especially in patients who are intolerant to very high doses of estatin therapy. This is another trial looking here at three different ways of treating LDL. So uh, the, in green, these are patients on atorvastatin 10 milligram, not controlled. They added to them azitimibe 10 milligram. In blue, these are patients on atorvastatin 10 milligram, but doubled to a 20 milligram. And in the gray, these patients on atorvastatin 10 milligram, they were switched to rosuvastatin 10 milligram, thinking it would have a higher potency. Um, as you can see, the most lowering effect was came that when added ezetimibe to the baseline statin, about 22% reduction, even much higher than switching a turvastatin 10 to rosuvastatin 10, which only achieved a 13% reduction from the baseline. Um, that becomes very clear if you look at other parameters other than LDL cholesterol, which is here, ABOB, as a whole a lipoprotein molecules causing the atherosclerosis, and even non-HDL cholesterol, which is the cholesterol part in these lipoproteins. Um, adding azetimibe with the atorvastatin can help you reduce ABOB by about 11%, statistically better than doubling the dose of atorvastatin or switching it to rosuvastatin. And even non-HDL reduction was achieved here about 18%, which is more than the doubling of atorva or uh, switching it to rosuvastatin 10. Um, the zetamibe adding to statin was looked in terms of clinical evidence of reducing clinical meaningful re end result, which was here cardiovascular events. Uh, from the improved trial, it was a large trial, about 18,000 patients. They were enrolled within the first 10 days after an acute cor coronary event, and they randomized either to simvastatin 40 with zetamibe versus simvastatin 40 alone, um, and they followed for a long period of time for about seven years. The end result, which was the primary outcome with cardiovascular death, MI, hospitalization for uh, unstable angina, and chronic re revascularization or stroke, was significantly reduced during this period of time. The amount of reduction was minimal, was about less than about 10%, or around 10%. But keep in mind, these patients are optimally treated for blood pressure, for diabetes, for LDL. They are on optimal doses of LDL, uh, but they're still not really the target range. And um, adding just azitimibe to this combination of therapy helped them to reduce uh, cardiovascular events. And what I see it's interesting is that the number needed to treat there is actually minimal, which is only 38 patients for this seven years to achieve one effect reduction. Um, they looked into the, with the improved trial, they looked into whether, we, who would benefit more, whether it, they're diabetics or non-diabetics, and interestingly, patients with diabetes benefited more in reduction of these cardiovascular outcomes compared to non-diabetes. And that was the only, almost only outcome that was, um, in terms of interaction, uh, p-value was significant, showing a beneficial effect in diabetic versus non-diabetic. Um, the other molecules, which was the PCKSK9 inhibitors, as we described them within the, how they act. Um, the uh, the Velocumab in the 40-year trial, uh, looking at LDL reduction, they enrolled a huge number of patients. About 40% of those population were diabetics, and they were looking at LDL reduction, whether these patients had diabetes or did not have a diabetes. And they had a similar LDL reduction, which is about 57 to 60% reduction, regardless of the diabetes status. And then also in the 40 year, they looked at cardiovascular outcomes. And it didn't matter if these patients were diabetics or non-diabetics. Both of them had achieved almost similar, about 23 to 27% reduction in the cardiovascular endpoints. Uh, the other molecule, which is alirucumab in the Odyssey outcome trial, similar way of how they tested. Large trial, about 30% of this population were diabetics, also randomized to alirucumab versus placebo. All these patients are optimally treated with statins. And um, optimally treated meaning, what I mean here is this, uh, the to maximally tolerated statins. Um, and then LDL reduction uh, was reduced the same, whether these patients had normal glycemia or even a diabetes, similar to about 50% reduction in their LDL. And also in terms of endpoints, cardiovascular endpoints, very similar reduction of these endpoints, whether these patients had the normal glycemia, diabetes, and even here in the Odyssey outcome, the added third category, which was prediabetes, and even in these population, the benefit was similar. So regardless of the diabetes status, these patients had a similar benefit with LDL reduction.
So what about residual fast, uh, vascular risk? So we understand that, you know, uh, when we're treating patients with diabetes and, and lipid disorders, we, uh, we look for all other risk factors uh, accompanying this comp uh, complex disease. So lifestyle management is important to lower risk, blood pressure control is important, um, um, A1C reduction, diabetes control generally, LDL reduction is important, but there are still some um, residual vascular risk that these patients still getting vascular events despite improving these outcomes. And this is, comes from our understanding of how we actually look at lipids and where our, uh, our target therapy is actually going. So um, from the from, from understanding from uh, the lip, lipoprotein, which I explained, um, the, the one that actually, uh, the target has always been therapy is the LDL cholesterol, which is the amount of cholesterol stored in these LDL particles. Now with this, we can appreciate that the most important lipoprotein that causes atherosclerosis is LDL. So whatever is packed within these lipoproteins of LDL is actually the one that gives the highest impact into atherosclerosis role. But there still there is other cholesterol packed into other um, uh, molecules, and with those we call them non-HDL. So they count with that the amount of cholesterol that is in the IDL or in the VLDL, which also can account for the production uh, of atherosclerotic disease. Some other things which is important um, as, a, as a marker also for, for even a target for therapy is the ABOB lipoproteins themselves. In the ABOB lipoproteins, actually, they are, you're actually, when you measure it, you're identifying the number of particles that's in the circulation that carries the lipids, which can be atherogenic. And that would be the optimal role of lipid therapy in terms of reduction. So if we look at triglyceride, which is another um, cholesterol marker uh, for the events of cardiovascular disease, you'll see that um, this has been described in multiple observational trials, that the higher the triglycerides, the higher hazard ratio for developing of atherosclerotic disease. And statins, generally, they can lower triglyceride to a small percentage. These percentages might be higher if the baseline triglyceride is higher. So if it's more than 2.8, the impact of statins can be lowered because you're actually lowering all the uh, LDL particles in the circulation at that point. Um, but there's other ways of treating and lowering triglyceride. One of them is uh, fibric acid derivatives, and they're, um, they're used in patients with hypertriglyceridemia generally. They activate what we call PPAR uh, alpha, and these are responsible to, do, to uh, increase the peripheral lipolysis and decrease the hepatic triglyceride reduction, and they can decrease triglyceride for about 25 to 50%. The older generation trials have used uh, fibrates uh, to lower cardiovascular disease, and they were successful in doing so, but that was before the era of starting and generalizing the use of a statin therapy. But understanding if these fibrates would work in patients who have been on statin therapy and optimal on them, that's where the challenge comes. The, f the first trial that tried to, to try to see that was the field trial. It was directed to diabetic patients who at enrollment, they were not using statin therapy, but during the trial, a lot of patients were introduced into statin therapy. These patients were given either a phenofibrate or a placebo in terms of lowering triglycerides. As a primary event, there was no reduction of cardiovascular disease, but some other uh, some markers or some uh, um, different parameters of this primary outcome, like non fatal my total cardiovascular events, coronary vascularization, actually has improved. So we don't know if this is related to the events of the statins that were introduced or the effect of triglyceride lowering. Another trial, which was the accord lipid trial, they followed a small group of individuals after the accord lipid uh, ended, which is a large trial done on lipid ma management and lowering, and they followed these patients as a post-trial follow-up, and as an overall patients, there was no reduction whether these patients given phenofibrate versus placebo. Only the patient who had high triglyceride at the baseline, like, like more, more than 2.3, or an HDL less than 0.9, had a beneficial effect. Uh, the, the last one, which was pub recently published, was the prominent trial, which was using Pima fibrate as another fibrate, which is more selective to PPAR alpha, reducing triglyceride in patients using statins, and that also did not really help to reduce cardiovascular disease. Fish oils, another way to lower triglycerides. Um, there was this landmark that's trial that actually showed a clinical effect on reducing cardiovascular disease, which was the EPA um, therapy of omega-3, which was the reduce it. Uh, a lot of trial, uh, about almost 60% were diabetics. Patients were already using statin therapy, and they, would, they tried to reduce their triglyceride by EPA. Everything was positive, meaning everything was showing significantly beneficial. 
cardiovascular events, death, everything was significant. Uh, this study has been judged a lot because of the use in the placebo arm where they're using a type of mineral, uh, mineral oil that could have been impacting the whole trial. There was a follow-up trial, another trial called the strength trial, also they used omega-3. I didn't really have a picture for it here, showing no beneficial effect also with omega-3 events, lowering triglycerides. So there is possible other uh, emerging therapies that uh, maybe we can um, in the future have in, um, um, more evidence to support the role of using triglyceride or even um, uh, lowering further LDL uh, therapies. In cholesterol, bambionic acid is uh, probably coming very soon and uh, 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 stage three or phase three clinical trials will probably come out very soon. Uh, triglyceride, where you talked about the fibrate, omega-3 fatty acid trials probably also will continue and other molecules related to lipoproteins could be also you in use and also for further therapies for lipoprotein little a what about guidelines I want to spend the next few slides a few minutes just describing these guidelines Guidelines. So, the, uh, there was a guidelines produced from the Gulf, from, um, led by Dr. Anasini and Saidin back in 2016 about um, plasma lipid disorders and how to treat them. So, they set up a LDL cholesterol goal as a primary treatment goal, uh, depending on the risk of patients. So, patients at the high risk individuals, they need to have an LDL of less than 1.8 uh, millimoles with a 50% reduction moderate risk individuals less than 2.6 with a 30% reduction. And as another primary treatment goal would be a non-HDL targeting a 0.8 millimole higher than the LDL target. So these two molecules or these two parameters, sorry, they would be a primary goal for targets. Um, the ADN starting from the 2019 have specified the statins to be either a high intensity statin or a moderate intensity statin. They were directing um, the, uh, the uh, the use of these therapies based on how much we actually want to achieve an LDL lowering. So atrovastatin um, 40 to 80 or rosuvastatin 20 to 40, these considered a very high intensity statins, whereas the other statins with the smaller doses, these considered as a moderate uh, intensity statins. And the ADA um, uh, described that if patients with diabetes uh, below the age of 40, if the 10-year risk for cardiovascular disease is elevated, these patients need to be on a high-intensity statins. If you cannot get their LDL below less than 1.8, then you can use azetamibe or a PCK9 inhibitor. Um, if they are young and they don't have other risk factors, then pain patient, you can hold off on giving them a statin. If these patients are above the age of 40, uh, then they need to be on a statin automatically then you can choose whether it's a moderate or a high intensity statin based on how much risk they carry. The higher risk they carry, a high intensity statin. A moderate intensity statin would be on the lower risk. What I think is the most beneficial one is actually the, from the European Society of Cardiology guidelines in Europe from 2019. I think that's most applicable because they describe clinical situation rather than just calculated um, risk. And here what they describe is that you, for diabetic population, Diabetic population divided into three groups, either the, in terms of risk, either they are moderate or a high or a very high. There is no diabetic that is actually a low risk. So in moderate risk individuals with diabetes, usually they are younger diabetics, uh, their diabetes duration been less than 10 years, they don't have any other risk factors. These LDL targets can be less than 2.6 with a non-HDL, a 3.4. Patients with a diabetes that have uh, without organ damage, but their diabetes duration been very long, more than 10 years, and have some other risk factors, then they have a high risk and their LDL needs to be less than 1.8 and a non-HDL 2.6. Patients with diabetes who have an end organ damage or have multiple risk factors, equal or more than three, these are patients at very high risk individuals, their LDL needs to be less than 1.4 and then an HDL cholesterol less than 2.2. In summary, elevated lipid levels are a risk factor for atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease, especially in patients with diabetes. Statins are proven to lower incidence and recurrence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and are the cornerstone of dyslipidemia management, even in patients with diabetes. Further LDL reduction can be achieved with the addition of azetamibe and PCKSK9 inhibitors. And non-HDL and ABOB containing lipid proteins are still potential targets for therapy to reduce residual cardiovascular disease risk. And your current dyslipidemia gut practice should concentrate on proven, safe, and effective medical therapy using the required statin intensity and the needed combination therapy. And with that, I end my presentation. Thank you so much.